super nervous. Super nervous. <laughs> you might want to just like jiggle a little, or I would be like, doing that nonstop. <laughs> <laughs> It's also a thing dogs do, just FYI. When they're very nervous, they shake because they're trying to shake it off. I do that. From the bed turn a spot to a fire, horizontal with I love. Horizontal with I love. Horizontal with I love. Welcome to Horizontal. It's slow radio. It's intimacies of all kinds. It's us lying down, wearing robes, and sharing secrets in your ears. Usually our conversation is long and languorous and lasts between three and five hours. When I release it, I divide it into two parts, if we recorded for three hours, and four parts, if we recorded for five. The first half of the conversation is available for everyone, always, in all the podcast places, and the second is available exclusively to patrons of the Horizontal Arts. You can become a patron for access to the full Horizontal by signing up on patreon.com slash horizontal with Lila, that's spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash horizontal with L-I-L-A. At the end of each conversation, I ask my guest to tell me a story. And the story marks the conclusion of our final episode together. It can be any personal story that falls under the broad umbrella of intimacy, sex, love, or relationships of any kind. In episode 102, You Can't Have Dibs on a Person, Dennis's story was about how he met his biological father, In episode 97, Let Me Show You What I Can Offer, Ladies was about the best sex of her entire life, which happened to be the week before with her partner, who was also a guest on that episode. I've had stories of being carried down a mountaintop on the back of a hunky guide, watching your wife have a miscarriage, giving your parents' body to science, a friend breakup, and a particularly epic tale about a skull. When I ask them to tell me that story, I say that it can have any kind of tone or outcome as long as it's a story that they truly desire to tell me. Because if they have the impulse to tell it, and they're also maybe just a little bit afraid to do so, it'll be the right one, a narrative that others need to hear. My live event, The Horizontal Storytelling Pajama Party, is an evening full of these stories. I get horizontal with my guests just like we do when we record a full episode, wearing robes, sharing a pillow, microphone above us, gazing upward as though stargazing or postcoital, or whispering in the wee hours of a really good sleepover. This quickie was recorded live in June 2019, at Horizontal Storytelling, the Summer Pride Edition. We all donned rainbow pajamas, noshed on milk and cookies, and curled up together, all 50 of us, to listen to five storytellers from across the LGBTQIA community, one after the other. In this quickie, I lie down with Kalina. I asked her what I should share about her when I introduced her that night, and this is what she told me. Kalina is a pansexual, poly-kinky Latinx woman and a first-generation Dominican-American. She loves 80s horror movies, powerlifting, and dancing. Her favorite author in elementary school was Edgar Allan Poe. She played roller derby for seven years, skating under the name Sugar Smacks. That's just fun to say, Sugar Smacks. Sugar Smacks. She was one of the few Latinas in derby when it was making a comeback. She loves dogs and has a soft spot for the difficult adoption cases. She's a former high school prom queen, although it was completely chosen at random. She believes food is a great expression of love and enjoys cooking, although she cannot bake a single thing successfully. 
She is currently an office manager and hopes to try and combine her administrative skills with her love of dogs into a career working with both disadvantaged humans and canines. Come lie down with us in Bushwick, Brooklyn, for a story called, If You're So Proud. (sighs) (laughs) Kalina, will you please tell me a story? I'm going to (laughs) try. I'll take that as a yes. (laughs) So I knew that I was different when I was four years old. It was pre-K, and her name was Elizida. And she had the kind of hair that's either very dirty blonde or very light brown. I'm a little hazy on where the the line is there. (laughs) And she had these hazel green eyes, and she had a barrette that she wore in her hair that had her name sort of embroidered, Elizida. And Mm. I liked her so much. We, I loved to play with her. I thought she was really fun. And one day we were playing, you know, everybody's playing house, and I wanted to play house with her. And the teacher comes over, and she goes, what are you doing? And we're like, well, we're playing house. And, you know, Elizida's a mommy, and I'm a mommy, and we have uh, tiger cubs and wolf cubs Mm -hmm. because somebody has to teach the tigers how to hunt and the wolves how to howl. (laughs) Like, it just made sense. Mm -hmm. And I remember the teacher told me that we couldn't play house because to play house, you had to have a mommy, a daddy, and a baby. And I really clearly remember that was the moment that I realized that there was something wrong because I didn't want to play house with one of the boys. I wanted to play house with her. And... We didn't want to have baby. We wanted to have, like, all these animal cubs. (laughs) I mean, obviously. (laughs) And after that, the teacher would would always make sure to separate us when we had play groups. Um, And I'd get in trouble if I tried to go play with her anyway. Um, I know, it really bummed me out. But I knew that there was just... I was so nervous because I was afraid she was going to tell my mom, like that the teacher would tell my mom or my dad. And I didn't know why it was wrong, but I knew that something was wrong because otherwise, why, what would they tell you that you're not supposed to be doing that? And I feel like I, for almost the rest of my existence, carried that level of unnameable shame about this. And I mean, fast forward, I'm six and I'm in first grade, and it was the first of 12 years of Catholic school. (laughs) Mm. Um, And there's a girl in class named Nancy, and she had dark black hair, and her mom would always curl her bangs into a real specific, like, single curl Every day. (laughs) Just like a little awning on her face. (laughs) And I was so smitten with her, and I thought that she was really smart. And again, the teacher, Miss Seal, would point out that we were playing too much together. And, you know, I was was always too being too touchy with people. Hmm. And... I mean, I was a sassy kid, so I was always just demanding, like, but why? But why? But why? (laughs) This comes up a lot. Um, But again, you know, people started kind of acting weird because they didn't want me to be like that with them. And it was just one of those things that, again, I knew that there was something wrong. I couldn't figure out what was wrong. And I had nobody. I had... There was nobody in my family that was queer. There was nobody family friend. Like, I didn't have any point of reference. I didn't even know what this was. Because uh, when I, growing up, you know, my parents, more my dad, but my parents were a little bit homophobic. So the only thing I knew was that, you know, things that you'd kind of randomly hear, but it was bad. It was bad to be gay. Like, they, there was something wrong with them, and that's why, you know, That's why it was bad. And I had no sense of direction there. I just knew there's something really wrong with me, and I couldn't figure it out. 
And so I learned to just stop talking to people. Like I learned I just preferred reading books because I mean, I was so scared of what it was, what if I said something wrong? What if I said something and everybody thought I was so weird and now nobody wanted to be my friend? Mm. And then in fourth grade, we got one new kid and all the girls liked him. Every girl was trying to sit next to him. They all wanted to talk to him. And I kind of liked him, too. I thought he was really nice, and he was really good at drawing, and he would draw me characters from Alvin and the Chipmunks. Aww. <laughs> and I remember that we would have to sit in little four groups, four-person groups, and I was chosen to sit next to him. And I thought that was just the coolest thing ever. Like, I get to sit next to the boy that everybody else likes, and I like him, too. And... I remember, you know, he and I would just talk about cartoons and I would compliment him on being such a good artiste, you know. Not everybody can capture Alvin. <laughs> <laughs> and he told me one morning that at lunch he was going to tell everybody that I was his girlfriend. Mm. I was over the moon. I, I'd never had somebody like me back. And I was, you know, I, I kind of started mentioning it to a couple of the girls who I guess friend would be the right term, but it honestly took years before it became like a real term. And lunch rolls around and people are sort of, you know, hanging out in the, the yard and we're all playing. And he comes over to a big group of us and he's like, I hear people are saying things about me and Kalina. And I'm like getting ready, like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, it's happening, it's happening, it's happening. And then he kind of just looks at me. He goes, I wouldn't go out with her. <sighs> You know, he's like, she's not pretty enough. And he's like, I don't know why she's telling everybody this. And I just stood there like a deer in headlights. And everybody's just suddenly looking at me, and I don't know what to do. And it just kind of blurts out that I, I lied. Sorry. Because I didn't know, I, it, it, I had no idea what I was saying. I just knew that I had done something wrong. And that became what most of my growing up was, was just trying to keep myself, at least with people that I liked, kind of, no, you don't get to like anybody, and nobody gets to like you. So I read more, and I immersed myself in music, and even then with friends, you know, I'd be like, oh, I like this song, and they're like, ooh, that's not a song that people like. So I started, little by little, putting myself into a little box and trying to be more like them. Because I figured, they all cool, they all have friends, that's what I have to do. I mean, there is still definitely... <sighs> there is still definitely spitfire parts of me. Like, when I was going for confirmation, which for people who maybe aren't Catholic, that don't know what confirmation is, is you choose your patron saint. And um, <laughs> I got into a lot of trouble and they almost didn't want to let me get confirmed mm -hmm. because, you know, everybody has to do a big essay, like, you know, an essay on which saint are you choosing? Why are you choosing them? And I went up and I, you know, said, I'm choosing Joan of Arc. And mm -hmm. <laughs> see, somebody knows. <laughs> And some, you know, the Sunday school teacher was like, well, why are you choosing Joan of Arc? And I was like, well, you know, for all her devotion and love of God, she was burned at the stake for being a quote-unquote witch. And they were like, we think you should choose someone else. <laughs> <laughs> and they kept trying to push Francis of Assisi on me because, oh, he likes animals and you like animals. And I'm like, but I'm choosing Joan of Arc. And they're like, we don't think it's an appropriate option. I'm like, well, you didn't say that we had to choose anyone in particular. I chose her. <laughs> so they made me write an additional essay explaining why I had to choose her so that I could write the essay that says why I chose her. <laughs> <laughs> and they told my parents, like, if she doesn't, you know, that I was being a little too strong-willed. And I had a lot of that in me when I was younger, where outside of romance and outside of 
love, there was just this deep sense of needing to be equal, of the fact that I was so sick of women being underfoot. Because I saw it in my family, in the extended family, you know, women did everything and the men got to not have to do everything, but they still got to complain about having to do everything. And the women never once were allowed to complain that you're doing everything because you're doing what you're supposed to. You work, you come home and you're a wife, and then you're a mom, and then you die. And that's your entire life and you should be happy for it. Hmm. And I think I'd mentioned this to you, the whole concept of like, you're not allowed to date, but why aren't you married? Like, yes! <laughs> it's, a, it's a really confusing thing to grow up with. <laughs> it's like, well, you can't date until you're 30. Oh, hon, but you're like 20. Why aren't you married yet? It's like this whole thing. Y tu novio? Y tu novio. <laughs> and your boyfriend. <laughs> and your husband. And his side family. Oh, no, we're not talking about this? Oh, okay, then. <laughs> I, I didn't get along with a lot of family because I would say shit like that. <laughs> there was also this thing that I became really close with my older brother, because it's my older brother, me, and then my younger brother. And I became, my older brother and I used to fight, like physical fights, like just big punch, slap, throwing things at each other. And, you know, people would try to explain, you don't hit girls. And he's like, but she's not a girl. She's my sister. Like it just, <laughs> there's, there, was, there was a disconnect. But as much as we fought, he was my big shelter. At some big family parties, God, I'm gonna get there. <laughs> there were family members that didn't know how to keep their hands to themselves. I'm sorry. And my older brother, who's only two years older than me, would see this where they would be calling me over and touching my shoulders, and I would get very uncomfortable. And he would stand there with me. Because when he stood there with me, they didn't bother me. Because he would tell them to leave me alone. And he got in trouble for being disrespectful. <laughs> But I mean, he was my savior. <laughs> and I mean, we're still really close. And we still have a lot of disagreements sometimes, but He protected me when I felt like nobody would believe me. To this day, he and I have, just both my brothers, we have this kind of a bond where they know things about me that nobody else knows. Because my entire life, they've helped me stay safe. They've helped me feel safe. They've never once questioned anything. And they would push me to be stronger, to be louder. Like when I was in high school and <laughs> I wanted to write a paper, an essay for my English class about the bitches in literature. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and my teacher, and again, this is, a, this is Catholic all-girls high school. My teacher is like, you don't have to use the word bitch. And I said, of course I have to use the word bitch. <laughs> it's a strong word. It's, it's what these women in all these stories are accused of. You know, I'm, I'm not going to allow the word to just be used against them. I'm going to be using it for them. And this was another instance of having to write an essay to explain why I had to use the word bitch <laughs> in that first essay. And I went in it. I talked about the historical significance of, you know, female wolves and, you know, the goddess Artemis and the huntress and, you know, why the term bitch was so necessary. And I got an A. Mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and in high school, I, it was very clear I was not allowed to date, but there were some girls that I definitely liked and sometimes we'd kiss, you know, like when nobody was around or when we were 
taking forever to change after gym class. <laughs> like, <laughs> it wasn't anything that lavish. It was, it was more just, we would hold hands and kiss, and I would love the smell and the touch and the way that they felt. And they seemed to enjoy it. But when I would finally be like, hey, I really like you, they'd be like, oh, wait, no. Uh, no, it's not like that. We were just having fun. It was stupid. Like, it's nothing. Why would you think it's something? And again, I learned, like, fuck. <laughs> I'm not allowed to like anybody because I don't have the right to. You know? Um, few times that we would invite the all-boys school over to dances, I would try to dance with some of the boys that I thought I liked, and it would be the same thing. I would go up to them and... It was this fun joke to kind of get enough people around to explain why I am not suitable. And I grew up with that feeling of you're too chubby, your boobs aren't big, you're really awkward, you like all these weird things, you know, your hair's really frizzy. Like, there was just always a reason why I was not worthy of being loved. And let's see, I am losing my... <laughs> You're doing great. I am shaking, holy crap. I'm looking at the notes that you made. It's your Aww. beautiful handwriting. <laughs> Thank you. So there's this thing that I've always felt with little kids. If you ever see so many little kids when they're really, really little and they're just learning to run around and learning to, to talk and speak, they are these just incredibly headstrong, self-confident little monsters. And I love it because they are just being such a true part of themselves where they're just like, if I don't like something, I don't like it. Why is there an argument? I don't want to eat this. I don't like it. You know, I like this. I like it to an intense degree. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, anybody in any kind of a fandom understands that. <laughs> but the world just, it beats you into submission. It judges you into submission. It uh. makes you know that being different is wrong because that means you're outside of the pack. And without the pack, you don't stand a chance. And it was... <laughs> Terrifying. It's scary. It's scary, the concept of not having anybody, of being on your own. So I, as I, you know, late teens and early 20s, I learned to mold myself around people to make myself more palatable to them. I would take any kind, of an, any kind of affectionate crumbs I could get, I would take it. And that is how one of my earliest relationships, he hit me a lot. And I would just tell myself, you're not trying hard enough. You're not letting him have his time. You are being too overbearing. Something you are doing is what is wrong. And I mean, it got to a point that there was a night I didn't think I was going to leave a room. I thought, this is it. This is, this is it. I'm done. And I made it out. I was pushed out of a moving vehicle because I wouldn't let him carve an initial on me. Like... <laughs> Yeah, no, I still have a little scar right there where he came at me with a fucking knife because I wouldn't let him carve an initial on me. And he was mad and just kind of pushed me out of the car because that was an asshole move. But no longer being in that relationship, I felt like I lost my opportunity. I lost my opportunity to be in a relationship. Mm. It didn't matter that he hit me when he wanted to. It mattered that I was not in a relationship and that was my one shot and that's it. And subsequent relationships were all pretty shitty because it was like, well, that's it. No one else is gonna like me. And then if someone else is shitty and it's like, well, that seems about right. 
And I met one guy, and he was great. <laughs> and he was loving, and he was kind, and he was patient. But we were also just in very different places in our lives, you know? He was in a place where he wanted wife and kids, and I was 20 at that point. And I knew I still kind of liked girls, like I wasn't sure. But I knew that I wasn't ready to let that go yet. And so we parted ways, really, you know, fairly amicably. And then I met the guy that would be my husband. And I knew right away I was going to be upfront with him. And I told him right off the bat, I like guys, but I also like girls. And he was like, okay, <laughs> that's totally fine. <laughs> you know, he thought it was hot. <laughs> and we dated for eight years before we got married. And in that time, things got a little strange. He would start really pushing for me to bring home a woman for him, for us. And he would start picking out people that I was friends with, people that I skated with when I was in Derby. And I would tell him, like, that's not how this works. <laughs> but, you know, he just kept pushing until I finally was like, all right, that's it. It's off the table. No more. And by saying that, I thought that that was going to make it better because now I wouldn't have that argument. But I didn't realize at the time that by saying that, that also meant I was, that was effectively shutting off a part of myself. You know, that was, that was my sexuality that I was putting a stop to as well. Mm. But I thought, you know, we've been together this long and I'm at the age where everybody kept asking me, when are we going to get married? And it was just, it seemed like the logical next step. Like, well, we've been together this long, you get married. So we got married. And it was a kind of wedding where, I'm going to say more than half of the people there, I didn't want to invite. Mm -hmm. But you invite them because, pa que no hablan, so that they don't talk. And I mean, even before we got married, I remember his, his mother came up to me at one of their parties. And she was like, oh, you know, I love my son. I'm like, oh, I love him too. He's really great. You did such a great job raising him. Like, you know, complimenting the mom. And she looks at me and she goes, you know, if he ever wanted to cheat on you, I'd help him because that's my baby and that's who comes first. Oh. <laughs> I was fucking dumbfounded. Like, what do you, how do you say that to someone? Why would you say that to someone? Even if you felt that way. For whatever twisted reason, why would you feel the need to share that with them? But I really foolishly told myself, like, I'm marrying him, not his family. And let me tell you, never believe that lie, people. Never believe that mm. lie. Our relationship was not great. I, I became a, the butt of a lot of his jokes. He would joke about my pansexuality with people and, you know, refer to me as being a whore. Because, oh, she'll fuck anything. And I'm like, that's weird because I've been monogamous with you for like nine years <laughs> at that point. <laughs> <laughs> that's really weird for you to say that. But it became this running joke of, oh, yeah, she'll, she, she'll fuck anybody. She's got no standards. And I was like, what does that say about you then? Like, <laughs> I could have picked from everybody, all the genders, and I chose you. What does that say? But apparently, that's, that's what it was. I became the joke to all his, a lot of his friends that I was, you know, she's a whore, she's a whore. Like, and I would tell him, like, hey, that, that really hurts my feelings when you say that. And I just had, according to him, learned to take a joke. And I couldn't understand why I was letting it bother me so much. Because, yeah, of course, I just have to learn to take a joke. Like, it's words. He's just saying a stupid joke. It's not like he's hit me. And that became a mantra I kept in my head. It's not like he's hitting me. It's not like he's hitting me. And it was a way for me to understand that I just needed to try harder. 
I needed to love harder. I needed to be more understanding. And we were together for 15 years. And towards the the last year, things were just really, really hard between us. And we weren't being intimate. And every time we tried to talk to each other, we were arguing. And I was depressed all the time. I was literally developed a case of gastritis, which is really severe stomach inflammation from the sheer amount of stress. I couldn't eat anything. It always felt like everything inside me was twisting. I was losing my hair in clumps. Like I was falling apart and I just kept telling myself, Kalina, you need to try harder. You need to love better. You need to be more understanding. It's not like he's hitting you. You need to figure out how to make this work because this is your chance. You are married. This is your one chance. And one day he mentioned that he had looked up into potentially being part of a program that would give him a scholarship to go to a kind of coding school that he had been interested in. And I was I knew he was so unhappy at his current job. I was like, that's great. I've been wanting him to go back to school to do something he wanted so that he'd be happier. And I was like, that's great. That's great. I'm so happy. I hope we get it. I hope you get it. Because he had always talked about doing it nights and weekends. And then he said, if I get it, you know, obviously I'd, I'd have to quit my job. And I said, wait, what? What do you mean quit your job? He's like, yeah, if I get it, I'd, I'm going to quit my job. I said, babe, this is something that you need to talk to me about. That's what that's what a relationship is. Like, you have to talk to me. Quit his job, and then you'd have to support and, you both. Yeah, but, like, he just thought that this wasn't going to be worth mentioning until he got it and he quit his job. And I'm like, you, but that's not, you, ah, like, <laughs> you have to talk to me. And I remember just stopping him and telling him, I am in this relationship 100%. I am trying really hard to make this work. I need to know that you're in this 100% with me. That's the only way this works. And he was quiet for a while. And he looked at me and said, I guess I'm not in it. And I looked at him like, what do you mean? We've been trying. We've been trying. I kept saying we've been trying when honestly... I had been trying. I was one person trying to make two people work. I had been looking up marriage counselors and reading all these articles about how to reconnect with your spouse. And and I looked at him and I said, when did you give up? So uh, to backtrack, six months prior, we had been, we had gone to see a movie with two friends and we were dri- they were driving us back home, and I don't even know how the topic came up, but he started talking about my sexuality and how open it is and how, like, she'll fuck anybody. And I was like, all right, you really need to stop. I've already told you that that hurts my feelings when you say that. And he said, if you're so proud, why aren't you out? And I told him, you know why. I grew up in a household that was homophobic. It was not safe. And by the time my dad in my 20s finally started coming around and really understanding the humanity of queer people, I was already in a deep relationship with a man and it just didn't feel like I needed to mention it and upset everybody and bring it up. Like, why? I'm already getting married to a man. And I told him, that's why. You know why. And it, he just started laughing. And I remember telling him, please stop. You're like, it's really hurting me that you say that. And he kept pushing and kept pushing. And oh, I thought you were so proud of yourself. I guess not. I mean, I guess it's not something you want to be proud of. You must not be proud of. And I kept telling him, please stop, please stop, stop. And this is in front of our friends, so I'm already really embarrassed about that part. And then he goes, well, you know, maybe it's not even real. It's not like you want to go, you know, it's not like you're ever talking about bringing girls home anymore. So, like, and I looked at him, and I was like, you 
you're not allowed to say that to me. So apparently that was the night that he decided to give up on our relationship because I finally found my boundary and I tried to stand my ground. And he just thought, we'll never be able to talk to each other again. But for six months that I was working my ass off to make our relationship work, he had checked out. And when he told me that, I had, that he had checked out six months ago, and just couldn't bother to have told me, there was something inside me that just profoundly broke. And I remember looking at him and I just said, I can't be here anymore. And I grabbed my phone and I immediately text my older brother and I'm like, you need to come pick me and the dog up, like right now. And I didn't hear back for 10 minutes. And I, at this, those 10 minutes, I'm already packing a weekend bag. I'm getting dog food in containers so I can take it. And then I haven't heard from my older brother, so I texted him. I said, I think I'm getting fucking divorced. You have to come get us. <laughs> and two seconds later, he's like, I'll be there in 15. And I'm walking around our apartment. And there's just everything in there that was everything I had built for us. You know, there's pictures, there's love letters, all of it's around, and none of it means anything anymore. And he just sat on the sofa while I packed. And I walked down four flights of stairs with a dog and too many bags for that point. And I got into my older brother's car and I cried. And I hyperventilated and I thought to myself, I just need to go back upstairs and apologize. And my brother, thank God, just drove on, not letting me get out. He drove me to his apartment because he's like, if we drive you to mom and dad's house now, they're going to freak out because you are really just all over right now. So he's like, let's go back to my place. We'll smoke a little pot. We'll calm down. We'll take some deep breaths and then we'll go. And so we did that. It did not help. <laughs> I was just trying and it was not happening. And I'm like, I just, I need to, I just needed to be like with my mom. He explained everything because I was just a weeping mess. And my poor dog has no idea what's going on. The first month that I was living back at home, I didn't get out of bed. I couldn't eat. I just laid there and I cried endlessly, trying to figure out what was so profoundly wrong with me. And little by little, friends that used to be his friends that became mutual friends were reaching out, telling me they can't believe how he treated me. They validated what I felt because they were like, yeah, we used to tell him all the time, like, why are you fucking talking to her like that? And little by little, over the first two months, I wanted to go back into powerlifting because I know that was making me so happy. And I was like, well, if you're going to go back to lifting, you got to start eating because mm. you can't lift weights on an empty stomach. <laughs> and then Everybody that I lifted weights with, they didn't know yet, but they would just be like, hey, we missed you. It's been a couple months. Oh, hey, your form's real great. And then one day they were like, hey, we're all, all going out for drinks after. You want to come? And I was like, um, uh, <laughs> sh sure. And I don't know why. I immediately texted my parents. I'm like, I'm going to go out for drinks with um, my friends. And mind you, 35 at this point. <laughs> this, this, this was 35. I'm texting my parents, is it okay? My mom's like, yes, please go. <laughs> like, be social. And so I started just going out again with people and learning how to do that by myself. Not being part of someone, not being worrying about molding into a certain persona. These people genuinely liked me for me. All the awkward, all the stupid jokes, mm -hmm. all the dance parties in between sets of lifting, like, they liked me. They wanted to hang out with me. And it was such a weird feeling. And my older brother is a DJ, 
And one night, his then girlfriend was DJing at a queer femme dance party in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I think you should come out to this. He's like, I'm going to sit in the back because it's, it is not my, not my place, not my scene. He's like, but I think you should. And I was like, okay, don't, don't tell mom. (laughs) (laughs) And so I go and I'm standing there. And at first, all I can see is what looks like people dancing with each other, like two people dancing here, two people dancing there. And I'm like, I've never been to a queer space in my entire life before that. I did not know what the etiquette was. My only point of reference for anything queer growing up was uh, Rocky Heart Picture Show. (laughs) (laughs) I saw it when I was like 10 and I was like, where, where do these people hang out? <laughs> how, how do I find these people? You know, people that were just dressed amazingly. And it wasn't a big thing that one minute they're with boys and the next minute they're with girls. And the next minute you don't know who they're with and it doesn't matter. It's not even a plot point. So I'm standing there and I'm looking. And as I start letting myself relax a little... I can see what's happening. It's just people dancing in groups and clumps. And I was like, fuck it, I'm, I'm gonna go dance. And I had no one to dance with and I walked in the middle and I just closed my eyes and I just let the beat move my body. Hmm. It was amazing. And suddenly this girl comes up to me and she's like, oh, I think you're such a great dancer. I love your hair. And I was like, oh, thanks. I love like your headpiece. And she was tall and wearing all these beautiful yellow flowers and this gorgeous elaborate outfit. I'm not sure how many are you here are familiar with Tiana, (laughs) but that was her. I actually... (laughs) I have a picture because she's like, we need to be friends. Literally grabs my phone and just took a (laughs) selfie with the two of us. I can pass it around. (laughs) Like, be cool and don't swipe around. Uh, (laughs) A lot has changed since since, uh, my divorce. So, you know, like, just be cool. (laughs) and I remember just dancing the entire night till my feet hurt and my knees hurt because again 35 (laughs) (laughs) and that was the first time in years that I finally laid down in bed at the end of the night watching the sun come up through the windows and I thought to myself like I think I might be okay Mm. I think I'm going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And so for the next few months, like, I went back into therapy and I worked on myself and I fixed my boundaries and I tried and I I saved money. And for the first time in my life, I got a place that was mine. I had literally went from living with my parents to living with my husband. Like, Mm -hmm. I never had my own place. Eight months after moving out, I had my own apartment and... I remember standing there after I signed the lease and just crying. Like (laughs) I kept touching all the walls and the cabinets going, this is mine and this is mine. (laughs) That crack over there, that's mine too. (laughs) And when I finally moved myself in and I brought my dog and I started buying little bits of furniture that I built by myself. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Do not sit very hard on any of the chairs, but they they will stand up. <laughs> and Christmas rolled around, and I finally like was like, okay, I'm going to come out to my parents. My brothers have known my entire life, but my parents didn't. And I said, it didn't matter before because I was married to a man, but that might not be the case in the future. So let's have this conversation. And so I invited them to my place, my little hobbit hole. The entire night I couldn't eat. I was just like trembling. I'm like, you know, I had a whole big speech prepared. It was really eloquent. It was amazing. I had quotes. 
like it was going to be really great. <laughs> and I just said, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this yet. I can't do this yet. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. And so, you know, I was giving them a big hug goodbye, and they're putting on their coats, and they picked up the bags, and I was like, you know, before you go, <laughs> I just wanted to say one more thing. And so they're like, um, okay, and they're standing there half in coats, like my mom's still putting away leftovers. And I was like, so... And I couldn't remember my speech. Uh. And the only words that came out were, so I'm not straight. <laughs> mm -hmm. And my mom just sort of, her jaw literally dropped. I've never actually seen that happen in a person, but it just. <laughs> mm. And my dad just kind of sat there looking at me and I was like, I've known this since I was four. Her name was Elizida. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I have loved all kinds of people, men, women, trans, non-binary. Like, I've loved everybody that I have found who I was attracted to their energy and their personality. And I'm pansexual. And so here's what that means. Because they've never heard the term before. And it was so hard. And I'm shaking. And there are tears coming out. And I was like, you know, I can't do this again. Also, by the way, I'm polyamorous. <laughs> <laughs> and here's what that means. Because <laughs> there's no way in hell I was going to have the energy to have that kind of talk again. <laughs> and so they're just sitting there. And everybody's really quiet. And my brothers come over to me and they give me a big hug and they tell me how much they love me. And my little brother starts laughing and he's just like, I forgot they didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, why is she coming out? Oh shit, yeah, mom and dad don't know. <laughs> and so my parents are just sitting there and my dad who I had been scared to death of finding out my entire life looks at me and he goes, well, people are born how they're born and you like who you like and it doesn't change who you are. I still love you. You're still my kid. <laughs> and I was shocked because like, I kind of was expecting my dad to be like having the freak out. My mom's just sitting there like, I had no idea. And I was like, really? <laughs> and she, you know, was just like, I mean, do you still love me? And she gets up and she like gives me this really big hug and she's like, of course we still love you. That's not going to change. Don't be stupid. <laughs> and then she holds like, takes her hands and puts them around my face and she looks at me really deeply and she just goes, so does this mean I'm not getting any grandkids? <laughs> <laughs> Too. That post on Instagram, that Instagram post is the first time I'm publicly saying I'm pansexual. And today was my first time. It is a coming out day! And I was holding a big sign that said, free hugs from your favorite queer Thea. Oh, <laughs> Turn a spot to a fire Horizontal with Lila Horizontal with Lila Horizontal with Lila Horizontal with Lila Rawest and intimate expression No matter how received, you still can't change the message A length without measure, a priceless affection The timeless connection of electric The feeling that we define as a pleasure Between you and I, a friendship's warm embrace like a fire The cherished moments shared like stars in the sky As the sun sets horizontal with Lila From the bed, turn a spark to a fire Horizontal with Lila 
This episode was mixed and mastered by Irving Godori, igrecording.com, on the interwebs. My cover art was illustrated by Shauna Shea, whom you can find on 99designs. The remix of my original intro music was created by Kid Mental, an acapella beatbox musician who is insanely talented. Get a theme song of your very own by hiring him on Fiverr or becoming his patron on patreon.com slash kidmental. Until next week, may you have the extra grace required to make it through the holidays and someone to love, something to do, and something to look forward to. I'm looking forward to two of my friends who have gone away indefinitely coming back to New York to visit. I can really use that company. In fact, it's the reason why I'm recording right now. Sometimes all you need is a bit of company. Thank you for listening. Thank you for getting horizontal. I have one challenge for you from the story. Uh-huh. I heard in, in the beginning the boy who, who who said he didn't like you, and we reconnected on Facebook two years ago. I fucking knew it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because not he only and his was his boyfriend are having a lovely time. <laughs> <laughs>